Please be seated, everyone. I have entitled uh, this new uh, this morning's message as embracing a Christ-centered marriage. Is it a revisit of Ephesians five? The famous British historian Edward Gibbon, uh, in his much acclaimed work, The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, argued that Rome was not destroyed from without. It actually imploded from within. He said that the strength of the Roman Empire was firstly founded upon its geography, upon the centrality of its location that at its peak, it was very strong militarily, it was very strong economically, it was very strong in its governance, legal, and political structures. Surprisingly, he also said that it was very strong because their family institutions were strong, and that lends cohesiveness to the entire society. But as the empire expanded, returning soldiers and uh, uh, governors and commanders brought back with them values, influences, and practices that are alien and foreign to their society. These values began to corrupt government, to divide society, and to fracture families. Under the weight of its sheer size and the corrupting influence of all these foreign values, moral decay set in into the entire uh, nation, which, which made it easily to be overrun by barbarians from the Germanic tribes in the West and the Ottoman Turks in the East. When families are weakened, society is weakened, and nations are weakened. One of the best known of uh, British anthropologists is Dr. Uh, Joseph Anwin. His lifelong work involves the study of 86 civilizations that spans 5,000 years of human history. And through all his studies, he says he came to one overriding conclusion. And he says, without exception, it is that the whole of human history does not contain a single instance of a group becoming civilized unless it has been absolutely monogamous nor is there any example of a group retaining its culture after it has adopted less rigorous customs. Meaning, the one man, one wife, family, is the bedrock of society. If families breaks down, civilization breaks down. And his findings, I think, is best articulated in modern English, today's English, by Pope John Paul II, who says, as the family goes, so goes the nation, and so goes the whole world in which we live. When family breaks down, the one man, one wife family breaks down, nations and civilization breaks down. So on that note, I want to bring you to the scripture for this morning and see how God instructs us that we may play a part individually to keep the one man, one wife family intact. Come with me uh, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 5, verse 22. Reading from verse 22, Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, 
as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the saviour. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Paul teaches us not the way the secular people teaches us in terms of marriage seminars, where they will give us a list of do's and don'ts. But Apostle Paul brings in or brings Jesus into the equation. The first thing that Paul does is to bring Jesus into our marriage. So he instructs the wife to submit to the husband, not uh, according to what the, whether the husband is worthy or whether you submit to the husband for his own sake. No, you submit to the husband as unto the Lord because the Lord Jesus is worthy. And when wife submits to their husband as unto the Lord, then the Lord steps in to protect and the Lord steps in to hold the family together. Uh, when we first did Ephesians 5 about a month ago, after the very comprehensive sermon by Pastor Stanley, uh, a young lady uh, in the second service uh, approached me and asked this question. See, given the time that we are in, when the wives, when some wives are better educated and more capable than the husband, wouldn't you consider it to be chauvinistic to ask the wife to submit to the husband? Wow, it's one of those theologically challenging moments. So at, uh, at that meeting, all I did was just assure her that in God's sight, men and women are equal. But we have different roles and different functions. God in his wisdom have put a divine order onto his creation. And when God gives a command or an instruction, it is always to the good of the person or to the group that he is uh, speaking to, that he is instructing or he is giving the command. And so it begs the question, what good accrues to the wife who submit and the husband who love? So I want to bring uh, to you through scripture the blessings that come when wives submit and husbands love. The first thing, of course, I have to uh, check all the concordant passages of this verse. And thankfully, the very first verse that I look at actually provided the answer. And it is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 5 to 6. Yeah, he says, for this way, the holy women of the past put their hope in God and make themselves beautiful. They submitted themselves to their own husbands, like Sarah, who obeyed Abraham and called him her Lord. You are her daughters if you do what is right. That means you are the daughters of Sarah if you submit to a husband as Sarah did. And because you are daughters, you inherit the legacies and the blessings of Sarah as she submitted, and that you do not give way to fear. What is this fear? It is your fear that when you submit, your husband takes advantage of you, he walks all over you, that he may even abuse you. But God says, if you submit in obedience, God then steps in and then protects and provides. And in the Bible, there are no insignificant detail. Every time a detail is given to you, it will point to something that is revelational. And so we were given a time when Sarah called Abraham Lord. Was there a time in the Bible that actually Sarah called Abraham Lord? So I searched uh, the whole Bible and there was only one instance that was recorded in the Bible for us. 
when Sarah actually called Abraham Lord. And this is found in Genesis chapter 18, where three men of God, that's the pre-incarnate Jesus, together with uh, two angels, probably angel, uh, uh, Gabriel and, uh, and uh, uh, Michael, paid a visit to Abraham in the Judean desert. When Abraham realized who they were, he quickly rushed off and told Sarah to prepare bread for their visitors. Well, he ran off and picked the best calf and told the servant to prepare a meal for their visitors. After that meal, this was the conversation that took place. The Lord asked, Abraham, where is your wife Sarah? In the tent. Then one of them said, I will surely return about this time next year and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Sarah was listening to the conversation behind the folds of the tent and watched Sarah's reaction. Yeah? She was listening at the entrance of the tent. Abraham and Sarah were already very old. And Sarah was past the age of child, childbearing. At this time, Abraham was 99 years old. Sarah was 90 years old. Sarah was already barren when she was young. At 90 years old, she is doubly barren. And so that's why Sarah laughed to herself. She said, she, she didn't laugh to anybody. She laughed to herself. She laughed in her heart and in her mind she thought, after I am worn out and my Lord is old. This is the only time that Sarah called uh, Abraham Lord. And he did not pronounce it to the world uh, that Abraham is Lord. It is a posture that has come into Sarah. She, it is in her thought that she calls Abraham Lord. And because he called Abraham Lord, and her thought of, uh, of laughing to herself and calling Abraham Lord, well, she was in the tent. Yet outside the tent, Jesus heard. Meaning, all our thoughts and everything that we have in our heart's desire, Jesus knows, Jesus hears. Because then the Lord said, to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh? And say, will, will I really have a child now that I am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? Jesus asked this of Abraham. Is there anything and Sarah too hard for the Lord? And we will come back to this later. This time next year, Sarah will have a child. Now that her thoughts is being uh, made aware of, Sarah's first words that Sarah speaks, she lied to God. Do you know? <laughs> I did not laugh, but even though she did, she lied to God. That's the very first time she opened her mouth, she lied to God. But Jesus then said, yes, you did laugh. And I think at that uh, day, they have a very wonderful time with lots of laughter. Because one year later, a son was born to Abraham and Sarah. And they call him Isaac, which means laughter. God wants to bring laughter into our marriage. God wants to bring laughter into our family. But what I want to draw your attention to is because Abraham, uh, Sarah submitted then scripture went on to describe the blessings that come to Sarah. I will summarize it for you first. It is found uh, a chapter later in chapter 20. And it says that because of her submission, Sarah was restored to youthfulness and fruitfulness. Because of her submission, it invited the protection of God upon her life. Because of her submission, 
it releases the provision of God upon her family. Submission restores youthfulness and fruitfulness. We know after that encounter in the Judean desert, Sarah and Abraham moved uh, to a place called Jira, which is uh, very near what is present-day Gaza. And because she was there, there was a king that runs over there. Something begins to transform in Sarah. And so Abraham told Sarah, tell people you are my sister, not my wife. You know? And actually, Sarah obeyed. Abraham, Abimelech, the king of Jera, then came and took Sarah. I do not for one minute believe that the, that the king of Jera is cross-eyed or need his eyesight examined. That he cannot tell the difference between a 20-year-old and a 90-year-old. Even if his eyesight has problems, the keepers of his harem would have never allowed an old lady to come into the harem. So something has transformed in Sarah. We know from, uh, from Hebrews 11 that because she obeyed, the Holy Spirit came upon her and renewed her womb to receive seed that she may conceive. Because her womb is renewed, all of her body is restored and rejuvenated to the full. How do I know it? Because in chapter 21, it says Sarah, when Isaac was born, Sarah nursed and wind Isaac. Meaning, Sarah breastfed Isaac. So the entire of her body was re rejuvenated. And I just got explanation from Pastor Lee Chu on the way up. Say, medically and scientifically, the moment the womb is renewed, that means the ovaries begins to produce egg. Hormones will all be produced. And the hormones will completely change a woman to her youthfulness again. Many of you go for beauty treatment. What do you get? Hormone jabs, you know. Ah, but now I've given you God's secret. Submit to your husband and your hormones will flow once again. <laughs> but not only is her res not only is her restored to fullness of youth. God comes in to protect Sarah. You know, look at Abraham. Abraham told Sarah, I tell people you are my sister, not my wife. What sort of a man did Sarah submit to? Someone who actually looks after his own welfare, his own well-being, and put the wife at risk. And yet, Sarah submitted. Because she submitted, God steps in to produce her, uh, to protect her. That night, look what happened. That night, God appeared in the dream of Abimelech and says, you are as good as dead because you have taken a married woman. Return her immediately, otherwise I will destroy your whole family. God threatened <coughs> this Abimelech and protected Sarah. Ladies, your husband, or rather your protection, need not necessarily comes from your husband. When you submit, God steps in to protect you. And then, submission releases the provision of God. After that night encounter with God, next morning, Abimelech quickly called 
upon all the uh, advisors, and they decided to do this. What did he say? Abimelech then brought sheep and cattle, male and female slaves, and gave them to Abraham. That's possession. Yeah? And he returned Sarah to him. And Abimelech said, my land is before you. Live wherever you like. So through his, her submission, suddenly the family has been given possession. The family has been given land as much as they want to take. Not only did he receive the protection of God, he also received provision and wealth. And Abimelech then gave a thousand shekels of silver to Abraham and Sarah. We know from Scripture, 500 years later, the Jews per family give half a shekel of silver to the uh, synagogue for its upkeep. Half a shekel 500 years later. And they got a thousand shekels 5,000 years earlier. Can you imagine the immensity of the wealth that was given to them? So when you submit, it is God who releases His favor. You will regain your fruitfulness. You will regain your youthfulness. You know, Abimelech, the king of Judah, who have many, many beautiful women, wanted even Sarah to be part of his harem. You will be given the provision, the fullness, the abundance of God, and you are released and also given the protection of God. Submission does not only release favor to the wife. Submission in accordance with the divine order releases blessings to everyone who submits, even the men, everyone. And so in the divine order, if we submit to our government, if we submit to our bosses in the workplace, if we submit to the church leaders, uh, whichever church you get, attend, God releases His blessings upon all who submit. Give you an example, Jesus itself. Jesus at age 12, at His Bar Mitzvah, means the coming of into manhood, Joseph and Mary took Jesus to Jerusalem to celebrate uh, the Feast of Passover. After the festival, Mary and uh, Joseph was walking home when they realized their son was not with them. They rushed back to Jerusalem and found Jesus three days later in the temple. And what was uh, he doing? He was having a dialogue with the rabbis of the day, the wise men of the day. And it's recorded for us that everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. Of course, he wrote the book, yeah? But what follows was amazing. Even though he is son of God, the prince of heaven, he went home to Nazareth and subjected him, himself, to his worldly parents. And when he did that, this is what happened. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature, and in favor with God and with men. When we submit, the favor of God comes upon us. And the greatest or the supreme example of submission is when Jesus went to Calvary. At the Garden of Gethsemane, he asked God of this, if possible, take away this cup from me but not my will, but yours be done. And so because it is God's will, Jesus went to Calvary and all mankind 
was saved. Jesus submitted and all of us was saved. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Jesus went to Calvary for his church, for his bride. Thankfully for all the husbands, we don't have to go to Calvary these days. And so I want to look at, even though we don't have to go to Calvary, Scripture commands us to love our wives. What does it mean then in practical sense to love your wives? So I looked at uh, Scripture and I thought maybe the best description of what to love practically means uh, it's found in uh, the book of John chapter 13 where it is at the, uh, where it is the Last Supper. And this was the final time that Jesus is meeting with his disciples and he wanted to speak to them to prepare them for life when he is no longer around. And throughout that chapter, there was only one emphasis. And that emphasis was to love. You know, the, the word love in English doesn't bring out the fullness of its meaning. I show you, like I say, I love my wife. But in the next breath, I say, I love Kari Laksa. So you can see it doesn't actually bring out the fullness of the word love. But in the uh, Greek, it is more precise. Yeah, there is four words to love in Greek. First is philio, which means brotherly affection for a friend. Then there is stoich, which is your affection, your compassion, and your caring for your siblings and your family. Of course, there is eros, uh, that is the romantic, physical, emotional feelings. And these feelings is actually very self-centered. It's about us just getting and receiving it's about us meeting our own needs. It is very much like Hollywood kind of love. And then, of course, there is the famous word, you know, uh, that is made famous by all the New Testament writers, and it's this word, agape, which Jesus uses. It means unconditional love. It is an exercise of your will. It is a deliberate choice that you make to love. We grow spiritually when our love transcends feeling. When our love becomes a choice that we make. And in chapter 13, it shows us how we are to love. Our neighbor, how we are to love our wife. And I summarize for you, love is a choice. We are to love like Jesus did. Firstly, it is an enduring commitment towards imperfect people, requiring actions and sacrifices, always seeking the highest good, resulting in God's glory. That's how we are to love our wife. An enduring commitment. Yeah? It starts by saying, well, they gather Jesus knows that he's going to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, his disciples, he loved them to the very end. When Jesus loved, it is to the very end. We are called to love our wives too, to the very end. As Christians, when we marry, our marriage vows calls for us to love to the very end to have and to hold, for better or for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness or in health, to love and to cherish, till death do us part. We are called to love to the very end. Even in the Old Testament, God already reminded us what this love is. As he has showed us, I have loved you, with an everlasting love, I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. 
our love to his wife must be everlasting and with unfailing kindness. Secondly, we are not only to love with an enduring commitment, but it is towards imperfect people. We ourselves and none of our spouse are perfect in any way. But God calls us to love all that is imperfect as well. After the verse that you see, when Jesus loved to the very end, immediately after that, two names was mentioned. And it is not coincident that these names are mentioned. The first is that of Judas. And Judas was about to betray Jesus. Jesus already knew Judas was about to betray him. And yet Jesus loved Judas. Who is Judas? Well, he was a thief. Judas loved money more than he loved Jesus. He was the treasurer, keeper of the money box for the group. And because he's a thief, he's always putting his hand into the money box and take it whenever he likes. Reminding us that uh, not that different from some of the past leaders, national leaders that we have, isn't it? The second name that was mentioned was Peter. Peter is someone who, when he opens his mouth, the shoe always gets in. And so he, gave, uh, he told Jesus, I will lay down my life for you. But Jesus turned around and said, very truly, I tell you, before the rooster crows, you would also have denied me three times. But yet, Jesus loved Peter. So Jesus, knowing that Judas was about to betray him, that Peter was to deny him, he still loved them to the very end. Love requires action and sacrifices. Let me put it to you in context. In chapter 12, on their way to the Last Supper in the upper room in that house, a dispute broke out between the disciples. They were arguing who is the greatest among them. And so that's why when they moved into the house, none of them took the position of the least of them. Under the culture at that point in time, the least of the household is the one who will bring a pail of water and wash the visitor's feet. Because it was dirt road, they walk around in sandals, their feet are messy. So the least of the, usually the least of the servants will come and wash the visitor's feet. But when they all went in, none of them wanted to play that role. They think they are greater than the other disciples. So what happened? Who took on that role? Jesus. So Jesus got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel, poured water, washed disciples' feet, drying them with the towel. Jesus acted. Look at all the words that I underline. They are all verbs, meaning love is action, not just words. When you say you love your wife, it is more than words. Action must follow. And if, like Jesus says, I am among you who serve. Yeah, Jesus said, I'm the least. So if you consider yourself greater than your wife, Scripture tells you, you are the one that needs to serve. For it is the greater that will serve the lesser. And it is always when we act, it is to seek the highest good of the person that we are loving. Yeah? It is not what's good for us. It is what's best for the person that you are doing. And Jesus told them, I do this as a lesson for all of you so that you will also seek the highest good for the one 
that you love. And as he did that, as he loved Judas, here he's talking about Judas, and all the disciples, the Son of Man is glorified, and God is glorified. When we love, when we submit to our husbands and love our wives, it is God that is glorified. Recap, Jesus is love. And we are called to love like Jesus. It is to be an enduring commitment towards imperfect people requiring our actions and sacrifices. It was very messy. You got to wash people's feet. Action requires us to get into other people's mess one. So as you get into the mess and to seek the highest good, God is then glorified. I now want to share uh, with you from the Heb from Hebrew words what husbands me, uh, signify, and it is interchangeable with the word bridegroom. In the Hebrew language, uh, every word will be made up of alphabets, and the alphabet carries a numerical value or it carries a picture. And when you put the alphabets together, it will give you the significance of that word. And so we will look at bridegroom or husband. You have the first alphabet, which is the word hat, which means fence. The second word is the word taft. In the original Hebrew, uh, taft is written as a cross, and it signifies sacrifice. Lastly, you have uh, the, uh, the word noon, which is a picture of a fish and it means believer. Many of you have Bibles that have the fish symbol on the cover of your Bible. It simply means that is the book of a believer. And so you have a husband that is friends, cross, and believer. What does it actually mean? It means a husband is fencing to a life of sacrifice of a believer. Then you ask, what's the life of a sacrifice of a believer? This is the sacrifice. Husbands, love your wife as Jesus loves the church and gave himself for her. Thankfully, like I say, we don't have to go off to Calvary these days. But there is a second part to Ephesians 5 that is in verse 26. This is the practical day-to-day -day application which we are to do. And it's this, that you are to make your wife holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. These are not words of salvation. Yeah? Salvation comes through the blood of Jesus. Here is washing your wife daily with water with your word. That means you wash her of the dirt that gathers from everyday living. The dirt uh, of frustration, of discouragement, of disappointment, of failures, of anger all of the negative emotions that comes with everyday living, the husband is to wash her, is to speak words that cleanses her, is to speak words that build her up, not tear her down, to speak words that will bring life and not destruction, to speak words that encourage, motivate, inspire, and to affirm. That's what the husband is called to do daily. And then you are says, you are to present her to himself. That means you must, in your very own eyes, you must see your wife as what? As radiant. Without stain. Without wrinkle. Without any blemish. Meaning even to today, even if you have married her for 50 years, you must see her more beautiful today than on the day that you marry her. That's what Scripture is asking you to do as a husband. And that 
you are to continue to provide for her. As you take care of your own body, you must do the same for your wife. That's what a husband is called to do. The word for wife or bride in uh, Hebrew is the word kala. And he has these three alphabets. It first have kaf. Kaf is actually the, uh, your extended open arm. This way. And it means bless. So now you know why when we pray for you, we lay our hands. It comes from this alphabet. Kaf. To bless. The second word is lamet, which is actually the ox goat, the a rod or a stick that you use to guide the goat in a certain direction. And it's a picture of learning and teaching. And then you have the word he, which is grace. So what is a wife? A wife is one that always blesses, always learning, always teaching, and always, always gracious in every circumstances. That's what a wife is called to be. Yeah? And so scripture tells us, wife, in the same way, submit yourselves to your own husband so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words, but by the behavior of their wives when they see purity and reverence of your lives. Nagging will never transform your husband. Wives have tried since time immemorial and none has succeeded. The only way you want to transform your husband is by the reverence that she sees in your life. Always blessing, always learning, always teaching, always gracious in every situation. And so when we look at the Hebrew description of a wife, what picture does it give us? Does it remind you of the Proverbs 31 wife? Some women read Proverbs 20, 31 and feel very discouraged. You said, that is a super, super woman. Huh? How to be like her? I thought so too. Until I remember the moment I thought that, the Holy Spirit came over me and rebuked me immediately, saying, there is no lies in God's word. And so God, so I said, if this is true, how then does a woman become a proverb 31 wife? Ah, ladies, do you want to know how to become a proverb 31 wife or not? <laughs> Firstly, there is no such thing as a proverb 31 wife women. There is only a Proverbs 31 wife. And that's God's gift. Because husband love, the husband gets a Proverbs 31 wife. But husbands must do certain things. Do you, ladies, do you know, do you want to know the key to you becoming a Proverbs 31 wife? Unfortunately, the key is not with you. The key is within your husband's hand. Now watch scripture. He says, a wife of noble character, who can find? She is worth far more than rubies. Telling all husbands, your wife is more precious than precious stones. And then, what is the husband required to do? Her husband has full confidence in her and lacks nothing of value. That means before you can, before you lack, uh, have nothing, uh, lack nothing of value, you must first have full confidence in your wife. I look at the Hebrew word for full confidence, and it's this word, beta. And beta means 
you are to completely trust. You are to make her secure and that you are to affirm her. That means you need to affirm her with your words daily. You build her up, not tear her down. You speak life, not destruction. You encourage, you motivate, you inspire, you affirm. Where did that come from? Ephesians 5, verse 20, uh, 26, which you have just read. Can you see scripture coming together? And as you do this, as you affirm and affirm and affirm, the wife then goes up to do all the things that is described from 12 to 27. And it's an amazing picture. Remember, this one is conformity with what God created women to be His help me. And that the fullness of that help me is now described in verse 12 to 27. She takes care of her whole family. He provided, he makes her, brings honor to her, her husband in the marketplace. She trades, she cooks, she sews, everything that she does. But only if the husband's daily speaks words that affirm her that make her feel secure. And as she performs this, then the husbands then, watch verse 28. The husbands then bless her and praise her. So between your affirmation and your praising of her, the wives then perform the fullness of what God has made her to be. And that's the gift for a husband who loves the wife. So husbands, I ask you, isn't that an excellent deal? All you need to do is open your mouth, man. And then she go and do all the work for you. Husband, apa lagi you Now I want to show you the Hebrew language is a very beautiful one. It is God who brings men and women together as one flesh. And when God brings a man and a woman together, this is what happened in one flesh. Now, Hebrew is read from right to left. The first alphabet of the wife and the husbands, when they come together, it forms the word koak. Or power. There are about 10 words in Hebrew that describes power. There is a word that describes uh, military power, economic power. Uh, this power of your speech, your physical, uh, your physical strength. Uh, about 10 words that describe power and one of them is this word called koak and it's unique only in the Hebrew language. When the husband and the wife come together, there is given this power. What is this power? Koak power is the power of fruitfulness, the power to make wealth, the power to grow in your abilities. God brings the men and the women together as one flesh. And it is God that will sustain the one man one woman relationship by releasing to them the koak power so that they can go out and earn and feed their families. Only given to the husbands and wife that come together as one. Let me show you from scripture. Yeah? When God created Adam, God took Adam out and put him in the Garden of Eden. And God told him, work it, take care of it. So, Adam's influence is over the garden. But when God brought Eve to Adam, and when they became one flesh, God then tells both of them, now have dominion and rule over the entire 
universe. Every time God brings a man and a woman together, their influence increases. Their power increases. And that's the beauty of a one man, one wife relationship of God's bring together to sustain society. And so I want to conclude with the first miracle that Jesus ever performed. The first miracle that Jesus ever performed was at the wedding. The first day of marriage at Cana. So what does it tell us? Jesus' first priority will always be your marriage and your family. Family is God building block for society. Way bef before he built churches and governments, he ordained families. And that's why that is God's first priority. Before blessing your business and your career, God wants to first bless your marriage and your family. And in this miracle, yeah, God, Jesus turned water into wine. What takes years of human effort Wine, good wine is produced. You need at least 10 years. Excellent wine, like in this case, more than 20 years. But in an instance, Jesus can come into your life and turn everything around. He can turn the bland water of marriage into intoxicating wine for your life and your family. But for Jesus to do the miracle, he must be present. Because he was present at the wedding, he was able then to change water into wine. Jesus must be present in our marriage and in our family for him to work the miracles in our lives and our family. So invite Jesus into our families and into our lives. And if Jesus can care for a nameless couple that is mentioned, Jesus can care for you and for me. Jesus can care for our family. And so as we close, I want to open the altar to pray for those who have a need in your family. It doesn't matter whether it is uh, a resource that you need or a healing that one of your family member needs or a reconciliation between children or between uh, parents and children. Whatever your need is in your family. It may even be because you are anxious that one of your son or daughter is sitting for a public examination at the end of this year. Come before Jesus and lay this upon Jesus. Let me show you, let me return to you. <coughs> to the question that Jesus asked Abraham and Sarah at that meeting in Genesis 18. Jesus asked of Abraham and Sarah. Is anything too difficult for the Lord? So we all need to ask the same questions ourselves. Given our circumstances today and our needs, is there anything really too difficult for the Lord? You answer that question. And as we open this altar, we would like to pray for all of you that has needs in your family. So that to, to pray with you and to pray for you. Heavenly Father, I truly thank you, Lord. That even as we come this morning, I just want to uphold every family that is represented here this morning. I now pray, Lord, that you establish every family here, Lord. 
in bonds of love that can never be broken, Lord. That each and every one will rise up, Lord, and begin to speak words that build up and never tear down. Words that bring life and never destruction. We will speak words that will motivate, encourage, inspire, affirm, and praise, Lord. Oh Lord, we pray that each and every one in our family will always be loving, kind, tender-hearted, and forgiving to each other as you are to all of us, Lord. So Lord, even as we uphold each and every family before you this morning, I now proclaim your ironic blessing upon all of them, Lord. That you will bless them and keep them. That you will make your face shine upon them and be gracious to them. That you will turn your countenance towards them and grant them your shalom peace, Lord. We give thanks, Abba Father, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you, everyone.